Americas actually. Come to all of you who are visiting. You guys, a special, special welcome. Lots of new faces. I would love to pick all of you guys out, but I won't do that to you, all of you guys who are visiting. It's enough to say welcome. We love that you have chosen to worship with us today here on this Sunday, very hot Sunday, but welcome. We are Hope Church, House of Prayer for Everyone. It is an acronym, and so we welcome you. These are the announcements. This building, by the way, if you did not know, is called The Gathering Place. So we abbreviate it and we say TGP a lot. We're referring to this building, The Gathering Place, and we gather here to worship on Sundays at 1215. We've been announcing this for a bit. The school year has begun. Last Sunday was Promotion Sunday. We pray for the teachers, for the volunteers. Um, we promoted all the kids up to the next uh, ministry level and whatnot. Um, this, I think there was some confusion. Parents, you must register your children for our Sunday school. So even if they were born and raised here literally from birth, you still have to register them. So this is going to happen every single year because, you know, different things change, information changes. So we need you, even if they had been going to our Hope Kids Sunday school for years and years and years, you need to register them again. Each child, if you have multiple children, each of them needs to be registered. If you have any questions, please talk to our elder Lam as well as um, Amy or Susan. We have our Living Life Bible Study, LLBS. We love acronyms here. So LLBS stands for Living Life Bible Study. We've already done it twice, and this is our third time. We offer it in the spring and the fall. So the fall course is happening on 9-11. It happens next Monday, so that's 9-11, September 11. It's a 13-week course. Please, please sign up, okay? You can sign up using the Church Center app, which is the same app that you use to register your kids and also for your offering. Um, so please do that. If you have any questions about this Bible study, talk to Pastor Q. Please, even if you are curious, even if you're on the fence about it, talk to Pastor Q because it does begin next Monday. So I believe next Sunday is the last day to register. Talk to Pastor Q. Our, it's a new month, and each month we highlight a different missions partner. And for the month of September, our missions partner is TC. She is serving and ministering in the 1040 window area. If you don't know what the 1040 window area is, look it up. Google it, something that we should have in our vocabulary. But that's where she's ministering, and we highlight her this month. Those are her prayer requests. First Wednesday of each month, our highlighted missions partner for that month joins us for our Wednesday night prayer meeting. Our prayer meeting, as I said, we love acronyms, is HOP, stands for Hour of Prayer. So every Wednesday, but this Wednesday, since it's the first Wednesday of the month, she will be joining us. It is on Zoom, so it's not in person, but if you can join us on Zoom for one hour of praying, she will join us from where she is overseas, and she will update us on her ministry, what's happening. We'll spend time praying for her and ministering to her as well. Please note, this Wednesday's HOP will not be live streamed. It will not be recorded or live streamed. So some of you who join us via our Facebook page, um, it will not be happening. You need to actually join us in the Zoom call. So if you have questions about that, the Zoom link or how do I do that, you can come and talk to me, but it will not be live streamed on Facebook. All right, new announcements. We have a whole bunch of them. Ministry Night with Lana Vasquez. She is another missions partner of ours, and she will be in town, and she is going to be doing a missions uh, ministry night with us next Saturday. That is September 16. It'll be at 6 o'clock downstairs in the Potomac Room. I wanted to read. She's the founder of Life Impact International. They work to prevent, rescue, and heal trafficked children exploited, trafficked, and sold children in the countries of Thailand, Myanmar, and Brazil. 
So she is our missions partner, and she will be here that weekend, and we will have a ministry night on Saturday, September uh, 16. Please um, invite your friends, invite other people, because there will be, it's not just a Hope Church event. There will be people from other churches, other pastors that will be coming. All right. Next announcement will be from our elder who prayed for us today. I don't like sharing. Oh, okay. Hello. We're having a picnic in the parking lot this time. It's cheaper. So I get to spend more money on games and food, which is a plus, I think. It'll be on the 17th at roughly 2 p.m. Um, bring your VIPs. We will have prizes. House church versus house church, cornhole, batman, and pickleball. So you have two weeks to practice if you don't know how to play any of those games. Um, if you are in house church, you are automatically entered in this tournament. If you are not in the house church, congratulations, you have two weeks to get into a house church. You can talk to Pastor Mimi. Um, there will be men's and women's divisions. Each division will win a $50 gift card. So do your best. Two-person teams, yes. Two-person, I'm not clear on the rule of cornhole, but the other two games, our two-person teams, and I'll figure out the rules for cornhole later. Um, but yeah, two-person teams, $50 gift card, men's and women's divisions for house churches. Also, your prize for eating together peacefully is that you will not be hungry. There will be a lot of food, so be sure to bring your appetites and your VIPs. Okay, thank you. That's it. All right, so as you know, every year we have our annual outdoor worship service and picnic at some pavilion or park, but this year we're just gonna have worship indoors. The worship part's indoors here, and then we're gonna go out immediately after the service, and our fellowship time will be outside, and it'll be a church picnic out there. The, oh, the entire, I think, parking lot is gonna be closed off. There's gonna be cones on that day to block off, so when you come on Sunday, Please um, follow the directions and don't park where you normally do because we're going to need the parking lot area to set up the tent, the games, uh, the food, the barbecue and everything. And we are emphasizing, please bring your VIPs. Please bring all your uh, non-Christian neighbors and friends and relatives uh, outside of Hope Church that would love to come and join us for that. All right. Continuing with new announcements. There is a camping trip that has been planned for Hope Church. This is open to everyone. Everyone is allowed to come. It's Sunday through Tuesday. So after church on Sunday, October 8th, uh, head over to Greenbrier State Park. A few years ago, we went camping there. So those of you who went a few years ago, you'll recognize it's the same dogwood loop. You need to pre-reserve your camping site. So Cindy, if you could raise your hand. Cindy is sitting right there, right in the smack in the middle. Please see Cindy as soon as possible about getting your, reserving your camping site. Because we want to, of course, be in the loop and all together. Um, join us for, it says, uh, Sunday through Tuesday. Join us to pitch a tent, eat yummy food together, share stories around the campfire, enjoy the rugged outdoors, and sleep under the stars. As I said, it's open to everyone. Please see Cindy. Next, save the date. This is kind of far in advance, but we're giving you a massive heads up. Save the date for our coffee house. It's going to be on Saturday, November 11th, and we need volunteers. We need you to help uh, with ideas. We need you to help plan for it, as well as needing volunteers on the day of so that we can do this uh, coffee house. It's a perfect opportunity, once again, to invite VIPs to invite your friends and relatives from outside of Hope Church. It's gonna be a wonderful, it starts at two o'clock, a wonderful event for just an open house. It's an open coffee house. So please save the date for that. All right, last announcement. It is a new month, and in September, we do want to thank our house church, Izmir. Izmir House Church is led by our shepherds, Janice and Keith Lee, and they are providing our Sunday fellowship food for the month of September. So we thank you to all members of the Izmir House Church. All right, at this time is uh, worship of giving. 
So if you can use the Church Center app as well as we have an offering plate up here, let's worship through giving. Did you all see David after he gave his offering? He was ready to come up here and pray for it too. I saw him. All right, thank you. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are a faithful father and you are the good, good father. Father, you are our Jehovah Jireh and a God of abundance and for our provider, Lord. We thank you that you are so good to us that we come to you, not with empty hands, but Father, we come to give unto you for the building of your kingdom here on earth. We pray, Lord, lift up prayers for those who are hurting among us, Father, those who are suffering, whether it's physical ailments, Lord, with the rise in COVID again and other illnesses, God, those who are fighting cancer and other diseases, Lord, we ask that you would draw near to those who are hurting, Father, those who are in dark places, God, especially whether it's suffering through mental health issues or um, any other sufferings, God, that this world gives us. We pray, Lord that they would draw near to you and that you would hear their prayers and draw near to them. Thank you for our missions partner, TC. Father, for the work that she is doing, we pray, God, a special measure of grace and provision over her. Father, and we just thank you for this new school year, that it will be such a blessing to our young ones and to all the teachers out there. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, um, what is this? Now it's all okay. All right. Now it's all okay. This Wednesday, I got to uh, go to UMBC because there is a first day of school at uh, UMBC the college. And uh, uh, just reminded me, uh, it was 1989, 34 years ago, God sent me to Maryland, uh, specifically to reach college students, 34 years ago. And 34 years ago, I started a campus ministry at UMBC. 34 years ago. So it was really monumental in the sense. But in light of that, uh, this year, we had one high school graduate going into university, which was Emma. So, so um, I got to have a coffee with Emma and pray for the first of our school year to, 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 to seek God first. So I just want to uh, uh, let, you know, Emma, can you stand? We, we didn't get to uh, acknowledge her and for her, you know, into a new uh, season in our life. And uh, let, let, let's pray a little bit. Father, we say you are our God, so you are good God. You are the God who leads us every single step of the way. You are God in our life, in our transitions. Father, we just come and thank you for your grace. Father God, uh, really especially this time, we thank you for Emma as she begins a new season in the new era in our life in university. Father, we ask your grace and mercy over her, strengthen her, God. She will be light in the campus. She will be the salt of the campus. Your love will be known. Your grace will ease. Your mercy, God. And that cold campus, many will come to know and honor your fine hope that is in you. So we give you glory. We lift her up before you, God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Old Hope Kids, you're released right now. You can go. You are Luo. You're released.
God is good. God is good. Let me remind us here. God is good. A little V. God is good. All the time. I want you to hear what I want you to hear what you're saying. That God is good and He is good all the time. And this is the battle that we face every single day. That everything around us will declare and, and, and any, many things will say, is God really good? Yes, we declare through our life and all that we do that God is good. He is good all the time. Amen? Amen. Let's come. Once again in prayer. Father, I ask right now, you and the innocent in your presence, God, we come that, Father, we receive your faith. We worship you, God. It's not about us. It's all about you, God. We come to honor and give you glory. We didn't come to, to fear something. We come to see you and give you glory and honor you. So God, come. We want to see your face. So God, even now we ask, you'll grant us your word. Your word will become flesh in our mess. And we will walk with you. Our life will be a worship unto you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Do you remember what Pastor Mimi said last week in the message? The 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 uh, the purpose of life is what the uh, the the reason we live on this earth is as a Christian. Number one, come on, somebody answered it last week. Bookman is not here, huh? Okay. <laughs> our, our purpose in life is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. I want you to hear very carefully. This is direct contradiction to what our country says. We live in purpose of, you know, and we are created, we talk about, you know, pursue happiness, in my happiness in life. So I want you to see something very important, you know, you know I, I'm sort of, this is not my note, but I just need to say this thing. This is important. That is, and, and on the way here, as, I, as I'm praying, as I come into church, I just, it just dawned on me, the message of the gospel the early church had was so different from ours these days. When they believed, when, they, when the pro, God's gospel proclaimed that in those days, the proclamation was, the king has come. If the king comes, we trust in him, we submit to him. Our lives change because we live under the rule of the king. Messiah has come. Now, nowadays, our mess, the gospel message we seem to hear is, God came to love you and give you all that you need. We don't preach about God as a king, as Lord, that he is. We talk about, you know, just, I'm, I'm, I feel I'm, I'm not rebuking anyone here, okay? Our worship became about us. We sing songs that we may feel good, we may feel God. Worship is about him, giving him the glory, not about me feeling something. The second that is the byproduct. We come to worship God because he is worthy, he is our God, he is mighty God. Yes, he loves us. Yes, he delights in us. But we come to worship him saying, we seek God first. He is our God and our king, amen? This is important because this is a basic. I don't know where I'm going with this. This is not in my message at all, okay? The title of today's message is Missed or Missing the Heart of God. Let me begin with a story. So I asked my wife in preparation for the message. So I am not good at giving gifts at all. I, that's, that's my worst, in, uh, of, you know, one of the worst of you know, the, uh, the love languages ever. So then I said, have, I have many, many failed attempts of giving gifts. So I asked her, what would be num my, my number one failure in giving gifts? She mentioned about Microwave, mentioned about, you know, the VCR. Some of you know the inside story here. And microwave was my first gift I gave to my wife on her birthday. And, and the VCR was my first gift I gave her on Mother's Day. And my first gift I gave to her, she called it baseball bat on Valentine's. My first ever Valentine's Day with her. If you're married... We have Valentine's Day, and, and, and oh, I, I should go get some flowers. 
By the time I went to the flower shop, all the flowers are gone. Not a single one, except this big, tall one. I don't even know what it is. It's literally this tall. I don't know what, it, what, what the name of the thing. It's a big thing. So they had about, about half a dozen lamps. I rolled it up. They covered it with the newspaper. It's like literally like a baseball bat, like this. I'm riding the church school bus, you know, the uh, campus bus back to my apartment. Everybody's saying, what is that? A flower for my wife. And all the other, other seminaries said, oh, I forgot to get flowers. They got yelled at because of my baseball bat. But when I brought it to her, I was like, what is that? Flower for you on Valentine's Day. It's so huge. You cannot find the, uh, find the base for that thing. She used a trash can to put that in there. Because, you know, and so she, that was the worst, one of the worst gifts. And pa- 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 people thought I was doing something special. Other, other husbands got yelled at their wives. But, but me, it was a last minute unprepared. And the point of the thing is, I failed of the gift giving. Because I missed the heart of all things. How was that about giving flower? It's about showing her that she is my love. She is my valentine. She is the love of my life. Not just duty to give her a flower. Some leftover flower that nobody wants. I don't know what to do. I don't know what she did with the flower. You can't even chop that up. It's just literally this big. Anyway. And as I prepared today's word, as I looked at today's passage, the, the thing that really... God reminded me it was somehow in the name of following God and, and serving God, we missed the heart of God. That's what, that's what you will see in today's text. Let's go stand the reading of the word. Luke chapter 14, verse 1 through 11. We'll be reading with ESV. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him, the guy who had dropsy, and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Verse 7, now he told a parable to those who were invited. When, the, when he noticed how they were choose, they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone, to a wedding feast, to not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, Move up, move up higher, then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. If this is a reading of the word of God. You may be seated. As I, the first portion that I saw, this is, the setting is Jesus was invited on a Sabbath day to a rule of the Pharisees' house. And there, so next 24 verses, verse 1 to 24, gives four different things what happened in that dinner at the table. I, really, I was really thinking about, maybe I want to uh, really title the message at the dinner with Jesus. But, you know, but I said, no, nah, that's... At the dinner, which is okay, that's, but you know, I, I changed the topic, any, uh, sermon title, any, anyhow. So there are four things here, so I'm going to f- focus on two this, this, mo- this afternoon. As I think about it, something really bothered me. One of the things we saw in the Gospel of Luke was that every single turn now, the Pharisees and rulers were looking to catch Jesus. They're trying to catch him and trying to, you know, really uh, put him away 
So why does he keep accepting the invitation to go to their homes? This is not even at the, at the, you know, the synagogue. He went to somebody's home. Somebody invited him. You see in this verse, they are watching him closely. Amplified version says, watching him carefully, watched, watching him closely and carefully, unquote, hoping to entrap him. This was a trap. But yet, Jesus still accepted the invitation. Why? So you, if you know some of your enemies inviting you time after time to trap you, why would you go? I wouldn't go, would you? Every single time that's what they're doing, why would you go? I never thought about it. Just something dawned on me. That is this. Jesus never avoided any confrontation. But he wasn't going there to fight. He was going there because, you know why? He came to seek and save the lost. Even those who are against him, they need to hear the kingdom of God. They need to know what God was doing, and they need to hear. So when, whenever he invited, he will not reject, he will go with them, and he will declare God's word and grace. He will not bargain with them, but he will tell them and teach about the kingdom of God because he wanted for them to come to know Christ as well. You know, I am... I'm avoid a heart. I don't want to go if there's any battle that have to happen. I, I am I avoid as much as possible, unless I really have to go. Otherwise, I will I'll avoid any conflict. That's me. I realize even that is not loving. If I care, Jesus, our Lord Jesus cared enough. Even the enemies, those are trying to entrap him, so that he may share the love of God with them, so that they may hear the gospel. They may not like it. They may be more en 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 enraged at him, but he will let them know his grace. He, will, he is he is firm. He is loving. He spoke the truth in love. In a number of places in the Bible, for example, in Luke chapter 11, it says, as he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him, to catch him in something he might say. So now look at verse 2. Say the word setup. Say it. This is a setup. Look at this. Look at verse 2. Now Jesus didn't have a dinner with them, and he goes in on the Sabbath day, and behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. You know what dropsy is? An old word. I think the new word is, I think, edema. This is really where at the NIV says, there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Edema really is accumulation of fluid in the body's tissues where circulation begins to fail. Where's Philip? I saw Philip here. It's Philip, you know, you know, I remember at times he'll come swell, the legs swelling like that because when you have a kidney problem sometimes or heart problem sometimes, you'll, your body tissue will, you know, will hold on to liquid and, and the water so that will be usually on the ankles and legs or not so they will be painful it is caused by heart and kidney problems it results in increased blood pressure this means tissue fluids fail to return to the capillaries and so build up in the patient's feet legs and organs eventually the patient may die by drowning due to fluid accumulation on the lung i know that's not that's not as, as difficult as Philip had, but he had times when he would get bloated up because the flu will be built up in his skin and things. This is a guy, and normally they would not invite this kind of person to their party such as important as this. But to that day, they invited him to come as a setup. They knew that Jesus would heal the guy. And there's another proof that Jesus who you know, is breaking the Sabbath law, which is not law, but their tradition. If he, if he does heal on the, uh, on the Sabbath day, one more proof that he is breaking the Sabbath, Sabbath law. If he doesn't heal the guy, Jesus is a hypocrite, coward, and who doesn't care about the hurting person. They're setting him up in that way. You know what, you know what, Jesus? Jesus knew all this was going on. Jesus now turns the table on them. 
He said, he turns and tells them, is it lawful to heal on Sabbath or not? He's not asking them, is it lawful? Is it right to heal on the Sabbath or not? Now, tables turn. If you are asked, so they are asked, is it right or not? So they are on the corner. If they say, no, you should not heal on Sabbath, they are a heartless person. Because common sense will tell you, even non-believers will tell you, healing on Sabbath is good. If you say, oh, you, sh you, you can, that they will be seen as, you know, weak on law, weak on the, on the keeping the Sabbath law and everything. So that's what they say, verse, look at verse, look at, look at the next verse. It says, but they remained silent. They remained silent. They couldn't answer. Either way, if they were table turns, or they, they were trapped in, in some ways. Jesus knew what they said. Jesus knew their heart where they were. They remained silent. They could not say yes. And, they, and if, they, if, they, if they yes, you could heal. It would appear soft and hypocritical regarding the stringent measures of the Sabbath observance. If they say no, or be accused of being inhuman, inhumane, and uncaring for the hurting. Look at verse 4. They are, they are but keep silent now. And Jesus turns and took the man, touched the man, and healed the man. And he says, sent him away. Sent him away. And so here's the thing that, you know, um, Jesus, you know, Jesus healed the man, touches the man, and, you know, and, and sent him away. Actually, the word here, sent him away, this is why you need to learn Greek. The word, sent him away, is the same word that was used in chapter 13 when the woman who had, you remember, bent double? When Jesus released the woman, same word, which is released, is here. That's the word is here. Or in Greek, it's luo. Some of us know what they mean, luo, luo, so, you know, we are smiling because we spent so much time memorizing them. Anyway, so, um, so but they translated as so he sent him away. Jesus touched and healed and released him from his bondage as well as you don't have to be here. They brought you here so that we are trapped for me so you, you can go. And he released him. And then he turns around and talks to the people, those who set up the thing. Those have nothing to say. He speaks to them and he rebukes them. And he says, verse 5, and he said to them, Which of you, having a son or ox, fall into a well on Sabbath day, will not go and take them out? Of course you would. Of course you would. Nobody will not do it. Everybody will do that. Everybody will take the son out of the well, even if he's been on the Sabbath, or oh, his ox. His point is, how much more if you are willing to pull out an ox or a son in a, on, a, on, a, on a danger on Sunday, Sabbath day, you should release him, how much more should you, should we heal on, do the right thing on the Sabbath? Of course you would. Is this man not worthy of your, is, the, is this man not worthy as much as your son and an ox? They could not, see, look what it says. They could not, they could not reply to what he said. They could not have no response. They were stumped. They couldn't say anything to Jesus. They knew Jesus was right. Inside, they, 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 you know, they, you know, they were not accepted, but, you know, they, 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 they kept, they couldn't respond at all. Listen, this is important. I know we make, Big deal out of Pharisees. But I want, I want you to know, Pharisees are good people. They were not a bad people. Their heart was, they want to bring about revival in the nation. Were, people were turning away from God. People were becoming more secular and all kind of things. They wanted the nation to be, the, they love God and follow God's ways. They believe that because, you know, they, the people of God are not living by God's word. That's why they were in this bondage of Roman Empire. So they, they wanted the restoration of God's rule in their nation, but in their pursuit of following God's law, they miss the heart of God. They miss the heart of God. The most important thing, they miss the heart of God. Just as like me with the baseball bat. 
miss the heart of God. That's the thing. Often when you're confused, when you are when you uh, when you have a wrong idea, you are so set in it, you became blind to what God is doing. And you know, and in Matthew, in Matthew's account, and it tells a story about, you know, it says in Matthew 9, and when the Pharisees saw, you know, this, and when Jesus being with the uh, 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 the sinners, and they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he, Jesus said, those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick. Remember, you may, remember the Pharisees upset Jesus spent time with the quote-unquote sinners? Verse 13, I have the passage for that. And go and learn what this means. I said, God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Because I desire mercy, not sacrifice. More than the rules, following the rules, I desire mercy. You miss the heart of God in your effort to follow God, in your own effort to follow God. You miss the heart of God. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. And you spine all the way to Jesus going to the cross. There were the religious leaders of badgering Jesus on this issue. You're breaking the Sabbath law. You're breaking the Sabbath law. Jesus saying, no, I'm not breaking the law at all. You, I'm, I, I, don't, I, I, I'm, I am disagreeing with your traditions. By saying, you are missed the heart of God. Heart of God is, a, you know, there's a quote that I found. I love this thing. By one of my favorite uh, Bible teachers. He's getting old now. Uh, Chuck Swindle. It says, brush aside the Jots and titters of man-made traditions cut through the fle uh, fleshy sinews of rules and regulations. You know, this is not my language. And, and penetrate the center of Old Testament law. What you get? You find the heart of God. And you discover it beats for people. All the laws and everything that God gave, it's all about God's heart for the people. You miss the heart of God. You miss the heart of God. It's not about rules and or not. It's about God's heart that he loves the people. He loves the world. He will give his son to die on the cross to set them free and heal them. Yet you made the rules and traditions binding people, not freeing them at all. It's the first part of the story here. First part, the second scene. Now they said that Jesus had, after all this, what do you think the atmosphere of the dinner will be? So heavy, or so awkward, right? And I, I, I bet you the, 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 the host of the house, they didn't know what to do. Awkward silence going on. In the end, and now as, as, as after a while, everybody's going back to their own things. You know, and people all watching what Jesus said, what he was doing, and now they're, everybody going back to the thing. And Jesus noticed something. He notices people trying, trying and jockeying to find the seats of honor. Look at verse 7. Now he told the parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor. He's saying to them, he's a God who, Jesus will notice this thing. Even the little things we do, and that reveals a lot about us. You know what parable is a little story that teaches big ideas, especially of the kingdom of God. Just told a little parable. The parable, some people call it a, a wedding feast parable. It's Jesus says, you know, Jesus explains the things, and I want you to hear what he says. Verse 8. When you are invited by someone to a wedding, wedding feast. Now you know this, you know, this passage is good for me. This is the year waiting for me. My two daughters are getting married. One got married in July, next one getting married in about a month, and a month or so. So it's a wedding feast, okay? But their wedding feast is a little different from ours, okay? Now, well, now we are wedding, now you know, the bride, mostly bride, and it takes a lot of time making sure that every, you know who is sitting where, right? The, the name card on the table so also you know where to sit. And they are wrecking their brain to make sure that you have right people, right place. And you know what? You put right, you know, people important closer to the you know, bride and groom table, table, right? Those who are less important way at the end. 
You know what I'm talking about. But here, but they, they, those days, they didn't have those name, name plates. So when you invite by someone to wedding feast, and everybody is on their own, you find your own seat. You sort of knew where you should go, but you know, but everybody wanted to just do not sit down in a place of honor because someone more distinguished than you maybe maybe haven't been invited. Verse nine: He who invited you both will come. He invited you both will come and say, "Hey, you, you're in a wrong seat. Can you give the seat to this person?" And this guy, you know, this you you you're sitting in the you know, the best part, you know, and then the, the, mass, the people come and say, wrong seat, can you give the seat? And now you have to get up. And the person who is in the seated in the honor, now you get up, everybody looking at you, oh my goodness, you try to find the seat, which is right at the end. That's what Jesus is saying. Look at verse 10. Instead, when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes by, he may say to you, hey friend, Move up higher. You're in the wrong place. Why are you here? You need to go all the way up there. Then you will be honored in the presence of all. Everybody says, oh, look at him. He must be important. And, and so, and who and who sit at the table? Look at me. Haven't we done this? Haven't we all, haven't we all done this sometime? Right? Come on. Don't, say, don't, don't lie. You know, when you go to a party or dinner or at a restaurant, a lot of people are invited. There's a long table. You know, you're looking at where's the best spot to go? Right? You come out, you, you know what I'm you know what I'm talking about. You don't want to be where you're at I cannot hear anything. You want to be where the, 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 the main person, the guest of honor will be, right? You want to go in somewhere in the middle where you can hear, you can be right in front. Whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Come on, don't lie, man. Where is the best seat? Seats near the guest of honor. You know, I, you know, that's true. You know, I remember when the uh, Gateway Thailand House Church had a, you know, that impromptu, I think, dinner on Saturday night. And, uh, you know, and we went to, I think, is it Cracker Barrel? Cracker Barrel, right? We went there, and like about 20 of us were there. And we were trying to find a seat. I want to sit next to Scott and Christina, and I want to hear what they're saying. It's, you know, as, uh, my mind is, well, you know, come on, we're all like that. No? Come on. Be honest. Oh, you, you are you are a, you are a, you know the uh, you know the grocery store pharmacy or whatever. But the line is long. You know what happened? They open the next line. You rush there so you can go there. But remember, you know what I'm talking about. You come on, come on, don't lie. I know you do that. You know, you know the line is long. And so when they open up, you act like you. Oh, you know what? And they're they're all looking at you. And, and, You lie. I remember a uh, number of years ago, we, went, we used to go to IHOP for one thing conference. I remember one of the first years, we took two church bus full of people to one thing conference. You know, and we, we drove 16 hours one, six hour straight one day, one, one, one way. And you know, I don't want to sit in the back with tens of thousands of people. I want to sit in the front. At 7 o'clock, they'll open the 9 o'clock. When they start, 7 o'clock, they open the door. I'll get there at 6.30. You know, when the door opened, I'm running, I'm running to the front, and I have, I have 20 papers with the reserve sign on it. I didn't save a seat for my, I said save a seat for every single person in my group, 20 plus. They end up changing, changing the rule just because of me. Just because of me. So I said, I'm hungry, I want to know, I want to be blessed by God. So does everybody. I was running and... and Mine, and you put your jacket on the thing, you, you, you put backpack on that thing. You know what I'm talking about. Place of honor. Isn't this normal in our culture? This is how we do things, right? Look at what T.S. Eliot says. Most of the trouble in the world is caused by people wanting to be important. I'm saying I'm more important than everybody else. I need to be blessed. I need to be in the front. I need to be sitting in the front. Let me talk a little bit about pride. And so this is, I'm saying this because I, I struggle with this probably more than anybody else I know. My wife tell, reminds me every day, life is not all about you, is it? I don't know how often I hear about it. She says, and you know, and because I live with six women, 
okay? I'm the only man in the house. My mother-in-law, my wife, and, you know, my sister-in-law and my, my three daughters. I was a king. I don't, do, I don't do dishes. I don't do nothing because they, we have many cooks. We have many people who do everything else. I was spoiled in so many ways. Life was all about me. Horrible. You, you see, I, I'm saying this because I am probably more, more guilty than anybody else I know. Pride is self-exaltation. Pride is a sense of self-importance. It's a world, it's, a, it's my world revolving around me. Self-centeredness, self-absorption. And it's all, all the selfish words out there. Pride. Pride makes us blind to our failures, to our weaknesses, to our need. It makes us think we are okay. You know, our culture says, and often we hear people saying, I've got poor self-image. I've got low self-esteem, as if this was the main issue of this life. The Bible says otherwise. The problem is just the reverse, the Bible says. It's that we think so much of ourselves that we get easily wounded when others don't think highly of us. According to scripture, the problem is this root issue of wanting to be in control, this drive to have the world revolving around me, this drive to have things work in a way that I want to have them work. This is the end of things. You say, I'm not like that. You know, in a, you know maybe we should do a pride test. Actually, I found many pride tests. You know, I, I don't know if you should do it or not, but... And one of, one of my favorite authors, uh, uh, Nancy T. Moss, one of my, one, I have a number of authors I love to read and listen to. Nancy T. Moss, one of those female authors I love to listen to. She wrote 40, what do you call, 40 proofs, evidences of pride. Let me throw up a few, just see whether you see yourself in it. Okay? There are many different ones out there. Number one. Do you look down on those who are less educated, less affluent, less refined, or less successful than yourself? Let me jump down. Are you quick to find fault with others and verbalize those faults to others? Do you give undue time or attention to your physical appearance? This may be fast me. Are you proud of the schedule you keep? How disciplined you are? How much you are able to accomplish? See, some people are, you know, I, I love the schedule I have. All my, all my calendar, everything worked out. Some of us are like that. Are you argumentative? You generally think that you are, your ways is the right way, the only way, or the best way. Do you have a touchy, sensitive spirit easily offended? What about this? Are you guilty of pretense, trying to leave a better impression of yourself than is honestly true? This is a good one. Do you have a hard time admitting when you're wrong? If you have not said, I'm sorry, I was wrong in the last two months. Think about it. You have never seen those two months? Think about it. Do you have a hard time expressing your real spiritual needs and struggles with others? Because you have to look good. You're talking about house church, isn't it? Are you excessive shy? You say shy? That's proud? Yes. Excessive shyness. Why is, why is it? Self-centeredness. What do other people think about me? Matters. It's about me. When you're excessively shy, you are thinking about yourself. That can be an evidence, a subtle form of pride. Or do you have a hard time reaching out and being friendly to 
people that you do not know at church? Or do you stick to your own little group there? How to reach out to new people? That can be pride. Do you, be, do, you, do you become defensive when you're criticized and corrected? I get. I do. What about this one, husbands? Do you tend to be controlling of your spouse? If you're not sure, by the way, ask your spouse. What about this one? Does your spouse feel intimidated by your spirituality? That's a good one, isn't it? Or this one. Does your husband feel like he can never measure up to your expectations? My wife never does that to me. Do you, do you talk about yourself too much? Do you worry about what other people think about you? This is good, isn't it? This is for all the Facebook who likes are about. We live for that. We live for, I have 3,000 friends in the Facebook. Do you neglect to express gratitude for little things? Do you neglect to prayer and in, in the reading of the word? How is that pride? It is a pride because when you're, what you're saying is, I can live my life without God and his help. Do you get hurt if your opinions are not considered? Do you, do you react to rules? This is a good one. Do you avoid participating in certain events for fear of being embarrassed or looking foolish? I knew somebody who never tried anything that she has never done because she wouldn't look bad. I remember that person, I, I don't know tell you who, you know, you know, playing the Korean, you know, the, the five stone game, you know, that thing. She never played, so she had, her friends are playing, so she didn't go. She stayed and practiced enough. She's all pretty decent, so she'll go ahead and be with her friends and play that thing. Is, is it hard for you to let others know when you need help? That's a form of pride. Now, if you've been thinking while, while I'm mentioning this test, if you've been thinking, oh, that person will be good for that, that person needs to hear it, that's a sign you are, you, are, you are proud as well. You see, we exist for God's glory and not our own. We exist to love and honor, serve and obey, enjoy God and help others. If I am at the center of the pyramid of my life, I cannot be loving and help and serve people. I don't, and I don't believe I have any, and then we end up saying, I don't believe I have any need of God. I become my own God, and I expect people to worship me. I don't expect to worship God by loving and serving people. You see, Jesus saw these leaders, religious leaders, who are supposed to know the heart of God and how they are behaving at the dinner. Jesus is saying, look what you're doing. Look at verse 4, 11, chapter 14, verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is, this, is, this is biblical principle. There's a place in the Bible where God dwells in the high place, but also among those who are humble, who are crushed in their spirit. Humble God will dwell there. Let me move on a little bit. No, let, me, let me say this. I think this is good. I, this is from one of the sermons I listened to. Mark Driscoll, he said, because you see, proud people, they make worst spouse. They make worst parent. They make worst friend. They make worst church member. Humble people. They, by grace of God, they can be a pretty good spouse, pretty good parent, pretty good friend, pretty good church member. He said, he said, Jesus said, 
Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Therefore, uh, in second, uh, first Peter chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud. Listen, God opposes the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. Now listen, this is, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost coming to an end here. Uh, remember one of, my, one of the well-known mission statements of our Lord Jesus was, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and is given life as a ransom for many. Even the Son of Man, the God himself, came to serve. That's who our God is. So much, you know, I, I could talk, I, I, I wrote down, I have 30 more pages that I'm going to, I'm going to mention a few things. He listened to this is good. I, I like this. I, I found this and I, I agree. Pride is natural. But true humility is a miracle. Let this sink in you. Pride is about being selfish. Humility is about being servant like Jesus. Pride is about getting glory. But humility is about giving glory. Pride is independence. Independent. Humility is about dependence. Pride is achieved. Humility is nothing you achieve. Pride is natural. True humility is supernatural. It's a miracle. Love that phrase. And I'll ask Andrew a couple, couple slides here. The answer to pride is not humility. Listen carefully. And since the pride is not humility, because humility is a byproduct of getting to know Jesus, the exalted one. Oh, I'm, I'm proud. I, I need to be humble. I want to be humble. I need to be humble. When you, you know what happens when you do that? But still focus on you. Like, you know, like Daniel Lee mentioned this morning, when you know, I said, I'm the humblest person in this world. I know he was joking. He was joking. I heard the story. There's, you know, this church. You know, in this church, they were they were giving you know honor, and this, they gave this person, you know, uh, the most humble person in the church. This guy was really humble and serving, and they gave him a little badge. So next Sunday he came wearing the badge of a humblest person in the church. That that just denied everything who who, who he was. When he said, "I'm trying, I want to be humble. I want, uh, how can I be humble?" That's not it. The way you become humble is by, if you want to grow in humility, don't focus on humility. Think about somebody else. His name is Jesus. Love, my favorite passage in the whole Bible is Philippians chapter 2. Have this attitude in yourself which was in Christ. You have this heart which was in Christ Jesus. Even he, although he Exists in the form of God. He was his God, fully God. Did not consider regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But emptied himself, taking the form of a bond, servant, slave, and being made in the likeness of man. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. You look to him. This is why Christ is the way, truth, and life. You look to him, our God, and he, how, who he was, how he was, how he loved us, how he lived his life in every way. And you become more like him. And you'll have his heart. You become more like him. Acknowledge our weakness. Acknowledge our brokenness. And, and come and trust in him for who he is. Look to him. Behold his glory and behold his face. God, I want to be more like you ask. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to, let me end with the one last verse. I bet you never, I bet you never seen this verse in this way. Look at this last verse. One of the famous verses, verses about the revival is in 2 Chronicles, uh, uh, in verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 14. It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray. 
When there is a need of revival in the nation, when there's brokenness in the nation, it says, if my people who are called by my humble themselves and pray, and the praise can come. When the humble themselves and pray and seek my face, it said, and turn from the wicked ways. I said, I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal the land. There is no revival. There's no revival. There's no transformation unless we come to the first step, first place. If you miss this step, you will never experience revival. You will never experience the nearness of God in your life, in your marriage, in your home. If you miss this foundational principle. I'm not yelling at you. I'm just, I'm just convicted in my heart. We have missed the heart of God. Are we missing the heart of God? I don't want to miss the heart of God. I don't want to carry another baseball bat. I don't want to buy another VCR. Miss the whole heart issue. When you look at everything in the scriptures, everything, what you'll find is, is God's heart. It beats for people. Our God, God's heart. Our God who humbled himself, gave up everything, humbled himself for our sake, for our love. Today we are celebrating communion. When you say, when you celebrate communion, we are humbled. The Savior has to die for me. When you do communion, we remind it that we cannot make it on our own. When it comes to communion, it speaks that we need one another. We are be a body of Christ together. When it comes to communion, we are saying, God, we need you. When I begin the prayer, when I pray in the morning prayers, one of, one of the first songs I sing is, oh, I need you, oh, I need Ebi I need thee, oh bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Father, we come today. We love you, God. God who loves us. God who emptied himself, humbled himself out of your love for us to rescue us to save us God we do love you our God we want to be more like you we want to see your glory come we worship your God we worship your God the throne of your God we worship you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ we pray amen We here at Hope Church, on the first Sunday of every month, we practice um, the sacrament, the holy sacrament of communion. As Pastor Q said, uh, we do this as a community, as a body of Christ, and we do this in remembrance of him. It was a commandment given to us, and so we come. We know that on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus was having a last supper. He was sitting and having dinner with his closest friends, his disciples. He took the bread that was on the table and after giving thanks to God above, he broke it. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he also took the cup that was on the table and he took the wine and in our case is juice. And he took the cup and in the same way he said this cup is sealed it's the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins whenever you drink it do this also remembering me and so it is
that when we gather together as a body of Christ and we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, we are proclaiming the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. We are certain that our Lord once came and he will come again. And that is what we celebrate today. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pour out, would you pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us here today and upon these gifts of bread and juice, that the bread that we break and the cup that we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by your spirit that you would make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this table today, unified in ministry in every place with all fellow believers. As this bread is Christ's body for us, would you send us out to be the body of Christ into the world? Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus, we take from your creation this bread and this juice, and we joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming again. And so it is with thanksgiving we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we say that this is the Lord's table and our Savior invites all those who trust in him and who love him to come and share. We invite all children who have been baptized. You do not have to be a member of Hope Church, even if you're visiting. If you trust in the Lord as your Savior and love him, you are welcome to the table. And also a note, if for whatever reason you wish not to come to the table, that is fine too. There's no peer pressure or anything like that. That is fine too. But all those who trust in the Lord are invited. Let's all stand. We'll have two lines come down the um, aisle and then exit around and then if you would like prayer pastor q and i will be on either end these are self-contained has a wafer and a juice please take it back to your seats and hold it and we will all eat and drink together after everyone has received it please come
Stand. Let's all stand together. We'll just sing the chorus of this uh, this last song, and then Pastor Q will come up and give a benediction. yourself, emptied yourself, even died on the cross. Not only to forgive us, not only to heal us, but your kingdom come. You'll bring about your reign on this earth. We love you, God. Help us be more and more like you in every way. Father, we want to have you all. Know your heart, know your ways, God. Walk in your grace. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, and the communion and the, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God be upon all who call upon the name of Jesus. Be upon who come and who are here in worship. Be upon our church from now until forever and ever. Amen. Just as always, if you got if God has spoken to you, if you need any prayers, we, 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 are, we will pray with you. We welcome you to come. 